Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. What is that like for you to go through it both in the book and then even... I look at that and I think, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have these notions that you're going to do something and then you find yourself in the middle of them and there's no turning back. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bet that's true. But, but I realized I had to actually live my life in order to write a book about it. Yeah. So, and what has it been like, writing a, writing a book, uh, you know, making that decision to write a book and now having this book out there and, and yeah. accompanying yeah. it? I didn't actually make the decision as a decision. In fact, when I started, it was, after, it was COVID and I was becalmed, and I don't do well in yeah. that circumstance. But I started writing little sketches. And you know how you keep files in your computer? Yeah. Mine was B dash dash K. Like, you know, when you can't say the word God, and you, right. you know, so, so I, for fear, like, of, ah. yeah, yeah, for fear of offending the literary <laughs> gods, I just didn't put that pressure on myself, but gradually it started to grow and then it became a book. Um, it was fine until I realized that I had to actually confront the horror of writing in the first person. Because I've always written these things mm. that were whether they were personal or not, they were in the mouths of very pretty, well-dressed people and nicely lit over there. Mm. And I had this sort of veil, I was protected. And that was just gone. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, who am I as I write myself? Because you're always, you're creating a persona whenever you write, but how close to the bone could I get? Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, I mean, I, I wrote a draft and I gave it to a couple of friends of mine who are very serious readers and they were very encouraging, but they both said the same thing to me, curiously enough. They said, you know, there's something you probably have said to a lot of writers you've worked with, or a lot of actors, and you've said, this is really good, but where are you in it? Mm, what an interesting question for something like this. What a, wow. And, and that was the next six drafts. Right. Yeah, really trying to say if I was gonna determine to be authentic to the degree that I was capable, yeah. That somehow enabled me then to be a little bit more truthful about the things I was writing about. Yeah, which I have a lot of questions about because that's got to be, I can't even imagine. Uh, before I do, I have to ask, you've, you've caused quite a bit of clickbait since the book has come out. <laughs> yes. Did you anticipate that? No, no. Yeah, I had a feeling because having been in the superhero world, I, I like learned very quickly like, oh my God, I remember like... I've gotten clickbait about the dumbest things. As soon as they can say Wonder Woman director, right. it just, I mean, anything you say. And so watching you go through it, I was like, oh, you poor guy. It's just, it's a new gross world of clickbait. You know, of course, what's, what's amazing about clickbait is that it literally could be two words that yeah. they've taken out of context and created this universe about, you just kind of laugh finally. Yeah. Yeah. Cam Newton, when he made a comment uh, about uh, being interested in uh, the football player, interesting for there to be a woman announcer, and somebody interviewed me. I had no idea who Cam Newton was. Right. I was walking out of a restaurant. They said, what do you think about what Cam Newton said? I said, well, you know, people got to learn at their own times. Headline, Patty Jenkins slams Cam Newton. <laughs> exactly. People need to learn. Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so let's dig into this. Right. I, I super enjoyed reading it. For me, it was fascinating. I was just telling you backstage, you are... 20 years ahead of me, 25, because you went to school quicker than I did, 20, 20 years ahead of me, and so to, the fact that we both went to AFI, and then we both went on such a similar journey, it was so interesting, it represents in the house, um, uh, to, to read this such an interesting thing, and you've done so much work, and such, you know, incredible work across the board. I so enjoyed reading this book. But because we shared that, um particular experience, 
I bet you felt closer to what I was going through. And I know, I mean, I'll, I'll just add that how we met actually is I didn't know you well, Yeah. but I remember you wrote something um, about, um, it was about emotion in film and somebody, somebody was trying to introduce you or take you down based on something that you had said. And I just sort of wrote you this letter and it began this kind of lovely sort of correspondence. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. yeah, and then we've we've had, you know, wonderful AFI connection yeah. ever since. That's so true. So I, I want to start talking about the book itself with this passage um, about you writing the book, where you write, when I started filling my notebooks, I couldn't have known how all-consuming making movies would be. What a manic, depressive roller coaster life of life it augured. The juxtapositions were so wrenching, weeks in dismal hotel rooms and a night uh, on the red carpet spent, uh, wait, where did I go? Anxiety attacks and acceptance speeches. How many months, years even had I spent waiting to see if movies are gonna happen, only to genially accept the crushing disappointment when it didn't. Even as life in the movies has given me so much joy, such personal fulfillment, and so many material perks, it's also taken a toll on my marriage, my children, my friendship, not to mention my physical and mental health. Could I write about what it's really like to make movies? Could I reveal certain ugly truths, not, not just about the creativity and the craft, but also about the cost, the personal cost? So what made now the time beyond it being COVID? Um, when I sat down during COVID, I did something which I've never done. I looked at some of my movies. I'm not that person. I've always been very forward, sort of hard charging. And as I looked at them, it wasn't the things that worked or the things that didn't that um, possessed me. It was, it was that procession of relationships. Mm -hmm. Just this, this, the scores of people with whom I've been in very intense, very personal you know, engagements, and some of whom I realized I would never see again, some of whom I never wanted to see again, but, but, you know, <laughs> but, but really this very important whole chapter of my life had been lived outside of my home with all these people. And mm -hmm. what did it mean? You know, why had I done that? What had led me to, to, to pursue this with such um, furor? And it wasn't, it wasn't money, it wasn't fame, it was something. Mm -hmm. And I tried to identify what that thing was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about it in that way because it is so true that going into it, we're, all you can think about is the movie. The movie, what the movie does, the movie, right. it's almost, we're almost divorced from it. But the truth is it becomes our life. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a living memory of a period of your time and, and all I, those and relationships. I had, a, had a very profound set of revelations somewhere in the midpoint, which was that it was my life and rather than eat my liver to make these things, I actually was able to try to experience the process and take pleasure from it because I was spending so much of my soul to it. Mm. And, and things changed for me at that moment in my process. Mm, when was that? I don't know if I could identify a moment, right. but um, you know, it might have been actually with the demise of Shakespeare in Love. Right. It might have been with the fact that that all came crashing down. That was a painful story. It was a painful story. And yet I was fine and mm -hmm. I, went on and, and, and I realized at that point I was maybe bulletproof in that regard, mm -hmm. that, that I had gained a certain amount of mastery, that things were gonna be all right, and that, that my whole sense of self and validation was actually not in the movies mm -hmm. anymore. It was at home, mm -hmm. it was with my friends, it was with the world, um, and, and it wasn't as if I was, that I cared any less, but I, 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 I took on a certain amount of um, uh, it's almost a kind of um, objective, uh, dis, uh, not, it's not dissociation, but it's, it's, it's less about um, me mm -hmm. and it's work as work as opposed to some sort of referendum about who I am. Mm -hmm. I completely relate with that. And, and I, I think we're both lucky that we have stable home lives and, and, and I've had that same thought where I'm like, okay, there's out there, which is how the movie did or whatever, and then there's in here and nothing changed in here. Exactly. <laughs> so so they, they have to be two separate things. Yep. And then that, you know, that definitely helps you. Passionate detachment. Yep. That's the phrase that occurred to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. How, how did you go, I mean, how do you decide what truths to say and what not to say? In the book? Yeah. Well, I sort of, 
I decided that anything was fair game except those things that were casually hurtful or private having to do with someone's um, life outside of the movie. Right. That there was the, the, the bright line was when it was involved with the movie. On the other hand, I decided that if somebody was stupid enough to misbehave um, in front of a writer, <laughs> that they deserve what they got. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. No, and it is kind of true, by the way. I always feel that way about when people ask you about, you know, people's reputations and stuff. It's sort of like it is what it is. If 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 somebody is doesn't behave well, it's you don't owe it to them to and, hide that. And by the way, life. we all talk to each other. You yeah. Know? If if I've got someone I'm going to cast, I will call you and you and say what is that like or that DP or whatever. And there is sort of honor among thieves. Big time. With directors. There has yeah. to be. I always tell the total truth. Yeah. And every time I hear somebody telling a story, I demand to know who they're talking about, about when they're terrible. <laughs> I'm like, you have to tell me who. Right. You have to tell me who. Spare yeah. me, you know? <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the title, Hits, Flops, and Other Illusions. You've had tons of hits. Um, which of And a them, lot of illusions. Yeah. And, but which <laughs> of the hits stand out, or do they all kind of roll in together? Like, which is, are there any ones that rise above the other or the experience? No, I don't think of it. I mean, I, I, I don't think that I could actually sit down and describe what movie, and, and what defines a hit anyway. Is that a critical hit? Is that a financial yeah. hit? Is it a success to esteem? I don't know. Um, no, I think um, I, the title comes from something that, that actually Preston Sturgis once said, which is a hit is the thing you do between flops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that had always stayed with me. Mm -hmm. But the illusions part, actually was hard to come up with because I wanted it to have some spin in the title, but there was, this is gonna sound very odd, um, there's, there's a, a, an Emily Dickinson poem that said that fame is a bee, it has a song, it has a sting, ah yes, it has a wing. Mm. And, and so the idea of having a third thing yeah. in there um, because it finally is we're in the world of illusion. Big time. And we are capable of self-deception. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who insist to actually live that. And so I sort of, that's how I decided. I, to I also it. like that, that the entire movie's an illusion until it comes out. So you, so you of course, are having abrupt uh, shifts in illusion day to day. I remember someone yeah. asking me, because I seem like, I, like everything's fine all the time. Yeah. And they were like, do you ever question? I was like, Every day, <laughs> every, every day, I think, is this going to work? Like, how is it, you know? So I, I think the illusion is a big part of it. I think every day of working, there's never been a single day that I have not felt defeated at the end of the day because you have this vaulted notion of what you're going to accomplish, and inevitably it's, 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 it's literally chipped away by time, by money, by your inability to do something well, by an actor's inability, and you feel at the end of the day, the remarkable part is that the elves come sometime at night mm -hmm. and then you I look loved at that when you wrote that about the script and sometimes you look <laughs> at the dailies the next day and you go oh well that's not so bad or your editor yeah or your editor puts something together where you've only been dwelling on that what didn't yeah. work and you go oh okay and then you somehow get the resolve to get up the next morning yeah. and, and then feel defeated again yeah every time I look at something and I'm like this whole everything is terrible I'm like go leave leave walk away <laughs> yeah. walk away <laughs> yeah. Yeah. not everything is terrible that's right. that's the day and so any of the so-called flops that yes. felt like flops at the time have any of them changed in with time and or do any of them stand out as stinging the the well I mean I do worst? maintain that you learn nothing from success I mean, I maintain that success is essentially mystifying. Mm. You don't entirely know. The gods aligned and the, the forces created this thing and, and you don't question it. And mm. it actually makes you a little bit anxious in, in the way that comedy makes you anxious, whereas tragedy actually makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. and, That's a fascinating observation. And, well, I mean, I think tragedy conforms to something that we understand about life intuitively and yeah. we actually accept that. Yeah. Where, you know, comedy, if somebody falls in a manhole in life, you know they're gonna they're gonna die. But in fact, in comedy, anyway. Yeah. Not, not what you asked. Um, what 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 was the question? To have any of the? Oh uh, yeah, failure. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, when you fail and you are you know confront that kind of humiliation and that kind of shame, you grow. 
you learn something from it. You examine it. Mm. You, you, you submit yourself to some kind of scrutiny, and and it, and you take something from it. Um, it's not easy, but you also learn that it's not if you're going to get hit. Mm -hmm. It's when. Yep. And what happens when you do? Yeah. Um, and you look at anybody's IMDb, any director that has any the privilege of going a long time, and there are these gaps, and there are these horrific things that happened, and then they rise again. And it's a, it's, I do say, in the, in the, it's a, a phrase that I have used before, that it is not a sprint, it's a distance event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And I also have always been surprised that success is very alienating. It makes mm -hmm. other people uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and it creates a huge amount of distance around you. So mm -hmm. Gal, Gal and I always talk about, at the height of the Wonder Woman thing, we were so alienated, everybody was keeping this distance, and it was like, wow, it's, it, wasn't, it, it, it wasn't a warm, it's not a warm uh, thing. It was something we were super grateful for, but it, was, it freaks people out. Yeah, the thing that happens sometimes with a, with a, with a, a flop is that people tend to s sort of separate. They tend to feel that there's a little stink on each mm -hmm. other, that they're, they're, it's very hard to maintain relationships sometimes when you've had an experience that mm -hmm. hasn't succeeded. And the real relationships are the ones that endure through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. So um, your partnership with Marshall, speaking of, this is 50 years, you guys. Marshall Herskowitz and you met in at AFI yep. and have just been incredible partners to each other ever since. I'm jealous and I wish I had a creative partner like that that was so consistent. Well, I mean, obviously we have been that and it's been more than that. I mean, I've learned from him things about being um, a husband and a father and mm -hmm. being a man and being a citizen and you know it's it, it is like a, having a brother which I never had and mm -hmm. I have now um, I was also smart enough to, um, to uh, affiliate myself with somebody who was smarter than I was and more talented than I was and nicer than I was um, and 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 he has remained that Mm, that's yeah. so great. What yeah. a wonderful, what a wonderful yeah. thing to have. My husband's, you know, is, is he's a, a writer. Long, yeah, he's a long-term creative partner of mine. Right. And you know, Gal is and Charlize and Chris Pine. I mean, I've, I've had a few, but not just one the whole time. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think you come to, like people and their pets. You come to resemble each other mm -hmm. a little bit, and and the, he yeah. has he has he has strengths that I've taken on, and I'd like to think that I have those that he has. But it's something else, which is the in Hollywood, and as you have any more success, there are fewer and fewer people to tell you that you're full of shit. Mm -hmm. And to have somebody that you can count on, mm -hmm. and not like, but we'll take that, we'll just unalloyed, we'll just give it to you. Yeah, so, so back to the beginning of your run, 30-something, yeah. yeah. huge, legendary hit, still stands the test of time, was an amazing show. What was that like? What was that journey like? Starting and stepping into something with it that was, kind of phenom around it, it. It was. It's so funny because we were we were young, and we didn't even know what was happening. We were working so hard, and we were also raising small children. Mm -hmm. And each, any either of those things is so completely absorbing. And to try to do both, and at the same time trying to write about what you're doing. It was like living in a hall of mirrors mm. um, because, uh, I mean, I would write about something having to do with, um, you know, child care, and my wife would have different opinions about it, and she was writing on the I, show. I can't even imagine. When I was reading that section <laughs> of the book, I was like, oh, my God, to yeah. be, try to be honest about what's really going on and then the different points of view. The best, the best paragraph, I think, of the entire book is a story in which I think I deputized Marshall to talk to Liberty about something, um, and in, ex in response, uh, it, I had to talk to Susan about a thing in their marriage, which Marshall then wrote and played the, and, and they were in counseling, and then he did an episode about it where he was the counselor. Oh my God. So it's, I mean, is there, I, I don't know. I can't believe that any of you are still married. Well. <laughs> like that's so. Actually, half of us are. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's like it's just to be that honest about you know. But that was to that week was, to week. Yeah, that but, is why the show was so great. Well, that gave it. We had license. Uh, somehow that get, it encouraged us to even do more, and we stole from the actors, and then they became part of the show. It right. was it was truly an ensemble because a lot of us had come from the theater. Mm -hmm. We'd worked in repertory theater, and there was some understanding that we would all be a part of 
something. And, and, and the passages that I write in there about all of us sitting in this little room, looking at dailies together and teaching, growing from each other, I couldn't have made glory after making about last night had I not had those 40 hours of mm. all the benefit of these talented people all in this kind of self-critical um, uh, crucible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I sort of think it was a first of its kind of that tone of show, too, because I feel like there'd been sitcoms or there had been soap yeah. operas, everybody, but not... Everybody was a doctor or a lawyer yeah. or a policeman, and the family shows were even more terrifying. Yeah. Because, you you know, they didn't... They looked like they were Martians, the way they behaved. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah. But the interesting thing now, it seems, is that that's the, the, the sort of norm. That you, that it, you know, you find a way to bring together a disparate group of people mm -hmm. and show them in relationship, but the franchise seems to be less important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, uh, I, and I think, in my opinion, of conversations I've had about TV, I think it might be suffering in the opposite direction sometimes, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of like, I don't know, we'll see what's, and it's like, well, maybe, maybe have a general maybe plan. Maybe a plot. Maybe have some sort of general plan. <laughs> right. You know, but um, so then you go and you make your first film about last night. Mm -hmm. What was what was it like? having learned all that you'd learned doing 30-something, then doing your first feature. Well, what was actually, different? no, believe it or not. Um, it I was did, during, right? No, I did it before. I did the oh, first. Did? I did about last night, and then we did 30-something. Oh, I thought it was in your first And it year. had an effect. I think, the, I think that domestic comedy found some you know, application to what we then did with 30-something, yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah. the other way around. Did, yeah. So was there, was there any big distinction you saw between the two, feature filmmaking and television? Yeah, well... I mean, it was just the, the, the grind of having to just do it. It took away preciousness. Mm -hmm. You had no choice. Mm -hmm. You were going to write it on Tuesday and shoot it on a Thursday and then cut it, and there were three others happening in different stages the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think it, you know, it was just a kind of, um, it, it really, we developed little sort of things that we believed, which is to say, okay, write it bad because you'll then write it better, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it, it, it freed me a lot, I think, um, artistically to just try it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's, and, and also, I would think it would be very emboldening to, to try it and have it work sometimes and say like, oh, wow, some, something really magical can happen right. very suddenly. On the other hand, it had another effect because it had worked so well, and then I'd done a movie uh, after that that had worked so well, mm -hmm. and then just got my ass completely handed to me in a movie that followed it. Right. Because I was a little bit arrogant and a little bit... Feeling like you'd cracked it. Uncritical that yeah. I somehow was going to be able to alone solve a thing that I couldn't solve. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. So, so speaking of Glory, won three Oscars, made a huge impact on Hollywood. What, what do you remember about making it? And, 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 and I remember everything. Yeah. I remember everything about it. It's one of those things, I mean, I, it's actually the longest and I think maybe the best chapter in the book because there was, I could have probably written a whole book about it. Mm -hmm. it. It was so much to take in from the creative challenge, the logistical challenge, the psychological challenges. Um, uh, there, were, there were the most wonderful things that came out of it. My relationship with Denzel came out of mm -hmm. it. A disastrous relationship with Matthew Broderick came out of it. Um, uh, the it actually taught me something about a movie, which is that a movie can be an organic thing that can change. Mm. You think you're making one movie and you discover something in the middle and you actually find yourself being drawn to something else and the movie changes. Mm -hmm. The movie that we made was not the movie we set out to make. Yeah, that, that was fascinating. And that was fascinating to me and again taught me something about my inclination to try to overdetermine things and then to find myself in the presence of something majestic, something, you know, rhapsodic that I could just actually humble myself and get out of its way. Mm -hmm. And that was a very important lesson not just about storytelling but also about actors. Mm -hmm. Being in the presence of that kind of genius, mm -hmm. you tend to realize that you don't necessarily have to, you know, do as much as you thought you had to, and you can attend to other things at times. Yeah, it sounded like Denzel and Morgan Freeman and, you know, all of, like, it sounds like that was really a phenomenon to watch them come into their own in those parts, and well, they brought what a to joy. It, 
they brought to it stuff that I, you know, could presume to understand but really couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you imagine, you know, I was really young and I was a white liberal kid from the suburbs, you know, writing lines like, you know, ain't much a matter, today we be men. And I thought I was gonna just, I'd gone through a certain amount of, of um, problematic stuff in the 1960s um, in, in terms of race and uh, in fact, it was met with the most extraordinary humor and goodwill. Mm. Um, and I only thought of later, when I did Defiance, that, that I could imitate my grandfather with a shtetl accent mm -hmm. in the same way that Morgan and Denzel or Jimmy could actually access this mm. part of themselves with um, real uh, confidence and, and, um, and aplomb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, what a journey. What I mean, just, yeah, and, yeah it, it's a beautiful movie, and, and what a great, you know, I, I felt like I learned a lot just reading it. Like, what a, you know what I was going to say also that I felt when I was making Monster, there was something about it being a true story, mm -hmm. that there was a certain kind of wind that came up behind you, you where that story wants to be told, and you have to get out of the way. That's exactly right. I felt that very much, and I was so grateful that that was my first experience, because I was like, I'm not really making the movie. The movie wants to be made, and I have to let it come through. I, I actually think that sometimes you think you make movies, but in fact, movies are making you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely felt that way and thought that when I read that about Glory. Yeah. So Shakespeare in Love, what a nightmare and a beautiful movie. <laughs> but just the fact that I had no idea the origin for it to be your baby mm -hmm. and that whole beginning. And then of course, it's such, a, it's such a different story now that we all know who Harvey was. And we all knew that, but yeah. Um, but that yeah. But yeah, I, he, he tried to come after Monster. He tried to get Monster, too. Once he found out that we were getting the heat away from Cold Mountain, well, he tried to buy us. Well, what's amazing is that he was not um, dealt with sooner. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, none of us knew about the, se the sexual depredations, but we mm -hmm. all knew about that, mo that monstrous aggression. Vicious, yeah. And, and I, 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 I thought a lot about that, actually, because, you know, Hollywood is not, it has no governance. And behavior like that is often tolerated. Mm -hmm. And he was big and he was scary and he was threatening. And a lot of people were just willing to kind of go, mm, okay. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that um, since. And, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, yeah. But I do think it, it, it is changing. And that was the one, as painful as that period of time was to go through. The, the good news is I do think, like, I, I started to become aware that really bad reputations, or, like nobody wants to deal with mm -hmm. the, the liability of the idea that that person could get canceled and ruin your whole movie, you yeah. know? Thank God. But anyway, how was it staying on the journey, making it as a producer? Well, I mean, truth be known, I, I, I had the most extraordinary experience of a lifetime working with Tom Stoppard. That mm -hmm. was a dream. Yeah. A dream that I'd had even when I was in the theater in college. I mean, that was the best it could ever be. And we created a thing. And you know how when you prep a movie, and I mean, Hitchcock said, when you prep a movie, you've already made it in your head. I had made that movie. We built sets at Pinewood. Yeah. We had costumes. It was a movie in mm. my mind. Once um, I took that odyssey of six years after that to try to get it made again, and finally did, but it turned out to be with Harvey, um, I was already in some way past it. Mm -hmm. And I was also fortunately about to make a very big movie and I, um, I absented myself from the process. I came back in to talk about post at times and the cuts, mm. but I was not there. Right. And so it was, it was a kind of weird cognitive dissonance that I knew this thing and then I saw it in a different form and John had done great work with it. Mm. You know, it's not as if something was ruined. It was right. maybe a little different in, in its various ways, but it was that script. Yeah. And so, um, it was, it was, uh, it was everything that you could imagine it to be, from the best to the worst, and ends with the most ambivalent, <laughs> odd moment of my life on stage yeah. with Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. Yeah. So bizarre. Very, very bizarre. I, and I can relate with that. I have a, a movie I was trying to make for a long time that I sit and I look at now, and I say, D am, is, am I still? Yeah. Am I still the person who wants to make that movie, or has well, something changed? It's still my favorite script I've ever written, but it's, we'll see if I make it or not. 
But then, um, so your two best known films, two of your best known, though they're a lot, all of them are pretty well known, Legend of the Fall and The Last Samurai with Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise, both at incredibly pivotal moments in their career, mm -hmm. and both about to spring on to doing you know, massive things, very influenced by this. Can you talk about how it was, it was pivotal in your career? Um, yeah, well, I mean, Legends of the Fall might not have happened had Shakespeare in Love not collapsed. Right. You know, so it's one of those things. It's, I first read, my girlfriend when I was 21 years old gave me the story written by Jim Harrison, which was the longest piece of fiction ever written in Esquire magazine. And I, I was 21. And I made the movie when I was 40. I still have the paperback that I bought that has my notes in it that I wrote when I was 23 of what I would have done if I got to make a movie. It was long really? before I made any movie. So you originally really automatically thought of it so as- I was so attached to this piece of material wow. and it stayed in me and stayed with me for, a, for that length of time. Um, it was very hard to find, to, to, to fashion a script. Mm -hmm. I had, I worked with a wonderful, first I hired Alvin Sargent, the god of all screenwriters mm -hmm. to work with me. He spent six months um, thinking about it and then said, I'm sorry, I can't do it and gave the money back. Mm. I then worked with a guy named Bill Whitliff, very talented, who wrote the Lonesome Dove series and a lot of other movies. And we worked together for a year and he did okay, but not really good mm. enough. And I felt that way and the studio felt that way and it languished then for more years. And it was literally after the collapse of Shakespeare in Love that I went to, um, uh, to Susan Shilliday, who was Marshall's wife mm -hmm. at that time with whom I'd worked on the television show. And I knew she loved the book and we sat down and in six weeks, cracked it. Wow. And the reason we cracked it is that the book, we were looking at it in some conventional way and the book in fact is like a piece of oral history told by a Native American. So it is not about psychological truths, it's about fate. You know, character is not fate, fate is fate. And so it took on this feeling of being a story told, almost like illustrated. Right. And it covers huge swaths, you know, swaths of time and, and, and relationship. And that was, suddenly that locked it. Mm. Just tell the story as a story, like someone by a campfire. Mm. And in fact, it begins with this old Indian telling the story. So that leads me to a question about how, how do you pick your projects to projects and how many things are you often developing at the same time? Do you want me to ask time? you that question? No, I, I, I would like to know, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I have had a weird journey because everybody just said no to me all the time ex <laughs> and wanted me to do things I didn't want to do. Right. And then it lined up with Wonder Woman, but it was very frustrating 10 years that nobody would make my films, which right. you would think somebody would have rolled the dice after making, well, you know, but they wouldn't. I mean. What I came to understand, I don't think I knew this right away, is that it has to be something that I think might interest me for two years so as to be able to interest an audience for two hours. Right. I mean, I'm easily bored. And it's a great I, gift for a director. Yeah. And, and, and I, um, I think I like to be a little scared. I think it, they're often about things yeah. that I don't know about. It's a little bit like going to graduate school for two years and learning yep. a different subject, whether it was about a, a historical moment or a political circumstance or whatever. So I, that, that gets my juices flowing. But I think I make these decisions impetuously and then suddenly understand the consequences of them. Mm. Because you don't necessarily know how you're gonna do a thing, you just know that you wanna do it. Mm -hmm. You know what, it, it has a lot to do, I think it has a lot to do with it has a lot to do with that 10 year old or 12 year old or 14 year old theater kid part of yourself that just love to do it mm -hmm. and what made you really happy and mm -hmm. what's gonna make you really happy doing it mm -hmm. and that you can stay in touch with that. If you can stay in touch with that, then you can have the will and the stamina to, to do it. So you're waiting for the next thing to, to, to add up to that and then it getting made. Yeah, yeah but you I know as I do, you can't just have one thing. You can't just run one horse. Maybe you can, I can't, yeah, you know. Yeah, I'm pretty singular. <laughs> Are you really, and, you, and you'll yeah. just? Not, not right, no, now I, I actually have a number of things. But See? in general, I get so myopic that mm -hmm. I'm just working on one thing when I'm writing. 
I just have found, I mean, some things have taken seven years or five years. I mean, as yeah. I get older, the runway is a lot shorter now, so it's a, maybe a little bit different. But, um, but you know, you have to have the right script and it has to be the right actor who wants to do it. And it has to be the, you know, the, mm -hmm. so it's like three cherries yeah. in the slot machine. They have to align before the money comes out the, you know, yeah. out the mouth. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. So uh, Blood Diamond, yeah. Another wonderful film, Triumph. Uh, I imagine that was a little scary to do because of such a truthful story. And how do you ride that line? Like, how? What was what was that like? And how did you? How were you careful to be respectful and well, all of that? Well, I mean, I approached it at first as if I was a journalist. I found the people who could really be the Virgil taking me into this world, and there were several people. Uh, I was very lucky to encounter a man named Sorius Samora, whose story is the most wonderful story. He was a journalist in Freetown when the attacks came by the RUF. And he filmed all of it on a bad um, Super 8 or a high 8 camera and smuggled himself on a ship to go to England to try to want people to know what happened, brought it to the BBC, and they said, no, it's below broadcast um, levels. We won't air it. Went back to Freetown bought himself another camera that he worked nights in order to f pay for, did it again, risked his life again to film wow. these things, went back to England, became, when he, they finally agreed to air it, became journalist of the year. Mm -hmm. And when I, in Google, was doing my various research about it, I saw this thing said, cry Freetown, uh, put in your credit card, and I gave my credit card, I wanted to get this tape that I'd heard about, and I got this letter that came with it saying, if you are Mr. Zwick, who is a filmmaker, perhaps you would also like to see blah, 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 blah. And I immediately realized this was like a vein of gold. Mm. And I not only said, I want to see it, I want to see you. And we brought him over. And then he came to Africa with us and became a kind of guide to me to meet child soldiers, to meet wow. people there. I then met a woman um, uh, who I saw the other night, um, actually in DC who had been married to one of the sons of the CEO of De Beers um, and hated them so desperately, she wanted to tell me everything that, I, that there was to know about that and diamond smuggling and the economics of it. Um, and then there, were, there was another woman that we met um, in Africa who worked with children in the settlements um, and had done acting classes for them as a means of just socializing, not even about acting. Mm. You know, so you begin to, to aggregate these people of real authority and moral authority. Yeah. And then you read a lot. And it was, it was um, you know, and, and by the way, I also, the, the people, um, I, I formed an affiliation with this group called Global Witness, the people who had created the Kimberly process that, have, that created the concept of blood diamonds. Mm. Um, uh, and you know, you put that all in a pot and you start s stirring it and stirring it. Um, but the story, I think, was, a, was really a way that I'd come to understand something about writing things that were in a political universe that the, you know, the, the original, um, that was based on a, a, a script that was not very successful in which this man was an American um, mercenary who was there looking for diamonds. Mm. But going to South Africa and seeing what it meant to be a white South African or a white Rhodesian at the time suddenly gave a whole spin to a character. Then, you know, meeting these journalists who were, you know, there to get this story, I realized that all three of these people were, had this kind of, um, this John Huston-like um, goal but they were in conflict, which is one wanted the story, one wanted the diamond, and this man wow. wanted his son. Right. And each of them could inhabit these different strands. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wrote on a little post-it that I put on my computer um, that said, the child is the diamond. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all came to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Well, and then there's Leo, which, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it Yet another tour de force actor that you got to wouldn't have happened with. had he not been willing to do it, you know. And that's the other thing about some of these actors. It was the same with Tom Cruise and Samurai. Mm -hmm. There might have been only one person that I mm -hmm. could have gotten that movie made with, and I was lucky enough to have them. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and how, how, how different, they've all been, they're very different, I'm sure, but sounds like all incredible consummate professionals, of course. Of course. That's why they work all the time. You bet. But any little different thing about directing Leo versus Tom versus Denzel? Well, I, I think in some way Leo and Tom are, are, are similar in that they have that real um, love of the thing, mm -hmm. and, and they work extremely hard and they are available. They're open to being directed. They mm -hmm. want to be directed. You know, Denzel is another order of magnitude. Denzel is self-contained in some way and has in him this kind of, uh, this inchoate rage, which is not always there in his personality, but is there when he's working, right. that he accesses. And so it was a more, it was, it was, it, it became, different as we worked together again and again, made several movies, but, and by the way, not that he's not as, every bit as professional as them, mm -hmm. but very different. Mm -hmm. Cruz comes from joy. I think that's his superpower. Mm. He just, what a nice he thing. loves to be there. He does, you know, he is, he, there's nobody happier who comes on that set any day. And when you've shot 120 days on three continents and somebody comes in with that energy, Mm. You have to respond. Wow, that's wonderful to yeah. hear. They yeah. all sound great to work with, but that sounds yeah. wonderful. Except Denzel. Yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but that would be fascinating. I can see that about him, too. I can see yeah. that kind of. And by the way, sitting here, nobody's funnier. Yeah. Nobody's more fun than funnier. Yeah. But sometimes the work is a little more comp complicated. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, so th you reveal for the first time that you were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2008, the same time you were making love and other drugs, mm -hmm. which is about, mm -hmm. you know, hear your quote, that I might be directing a movie about illness while fighting an illness was an irony that didn't go unnoticed. What was that like? Well, um, the sequence was such that I was diagnosed um, and given the green light to make the movie around the same time. and. I actually think that it was something that helped me. I think that this notion of, of having something else besides that to think about right. was really helpful. Um, Jake and Annie were wonderful because they understood that I was gonna go through that. Um, I've never been, I mean, the fact that I came through it, we started sh shooting like three or four weeks after I finished chemo. Mm. Um, uh, I've never been happier on a set because when I was sick, I thought that I would never get to do it again. And so um, I, I, after that, I was playing with house money. It was wow. just, you know, it was just delightful and it was a delightful experience. Josh Gad was wonderful and, and Jake and Annie were very available and it was a very intimate movie. Mm. And, it was, and, and I didn't have to be on a battlefield with explosions going off, whatever, which, was a good thing at that yeah. moment, yeah. And you're also turning the darkness into light in a way. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're making art out of like, wh like what, what else is there, but to, like I always, I had a moment, a revelation in my youth where I was like, what's art and what's not art? And I was going through DVDs and I was saying, and all of a sudden I had this eureka moment and I was like, oh, art, not art, art, not art. And I suddenly realized that my definition of it was art is when you let the life experience come in to you like a prism and send something back that's, out that's versus like executing sometimes there's things which are not art where you're just like we're going to make a little blah 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 versus like taking it in and sending it back out into the world right i always feel in those those things where you're just going to when when it's not art i can always hear the meeting yeah you know i yeah. i just know and that that's when i just sort of i just turn away go okay this is fine yeah. but i just and I remember coming up and meeting young filmmakers and hearing a couple of them who had who were very talented say, oh, I'm just making this little. And I was like, well, don't do that. You know, like, right. don't just try to make it great. At least don't don't already relegate it to it's a it's a dumb little jewel thief yeah. thing. Aim low and then miss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so switching gears, since okay. since this is a memoir, you write. Uh, candidly, how I managed to balance the life of an artist that 
uh, with that of a husband and a father is impossible to envision without having lucked into the right marriage. Even as I write this, I can imagine Liberty in the background saying, you mean the one with Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, these... that tells you all you need to know about my wife, yeah. which, which is that she, um, she has extraordinary um, uh, humor and extraordinary strength. Yeah, she's, she's great. I, I, I've never met her, or I've met her once, but I, I really I like her. I think she's <laughs> she's the she's the co-star of the book. Yeah, Marshall's I, the I really other like her from your description. Yeah, yeah. So, what's it like navigating all these relationships as you're doing pursuing this art? Um, impossible. I, I can't say that I you know succeeded utterly. Mm. I think I did my best, but um, without her couldn't have happened, I wouldn't have had the family that I have. Uh, she made choices at times to um, abjure, uh, you know, to not do certain things. Uh, it's a little known fact that Marshall offered her to play the part of um, Hope in 30 something. Wow. And she turned it down. Wow. Yeah, because she wanted to raise her children. And uh, she, yeah. we have, we've traded on her talent mercilessly to write for us on the television shows, mm -hmm. but she cares a lot more about her um, uh, political stuff than she cares about Hollywood, mm -hmm. which was a pretty healthy thing for me, actually. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. I, I think it's important to, to, to not make your home just in this one arena of caring about all of this. Right. And that's wonderful. So your films and television have uh, had massive, massive success, both when released and now, uh, you know, you're, they're being an, introduced to a new generation. How do they change? Like, how do they change over time, like this incredible body of work? Oh. I'm not very good at describing my stuff like that. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually think that there's um, there's a consistency that I can talk about, which was I think I can find a vein of liberal humanism that that describes a mm. set of values and behaviors that I think I can find in different movies. I mean, I think that's the thing that I lament seeing not enough of in some of the things that I see now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not answering this question very well. No, you are. Yeah, yeah but, but when you started rewatching, okay, so we'll say during COVID when you started rewatching things, right. just for your own point of view, how did the, how, what was it like and what did you see changing? See differently? Um, uh, I, th I think I'm a, I was a little less eager to please than I had been mm -hmm. early on. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I allowed myself to be influenced by three different cinematographers in very strong ways. Genius is all of them. One was John Toll, one was Roger Deakins, the other was Eduardo Serra. Mm -hmm. And when you put yourself in relationship with people like that, you were inevitably influenced in a way that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I gave over a kind of um, an approach in each time and allowed that to be influenced by those guys. Mm, wonderful. I see that. Yeah, that's cool. That would be a cool thing to yeah. note. So I have no idea if we're, oh, we're right on time. It's good for my last question though. Okay. What's up next? Uh, <laughs> um, it, there, there are a couple of things that we're working on actually. We're writing an adaptation of a Stephen King novel and not a fantasy, not a horror or fantasy, but actually more in the, hu the sort of humanist vein of, of Shawshank and Stand By Me. Mm. Um, we're doing something very, I hope, um, provocative, uh, uh, that's politically provocative, which I can't really talk about, but there's always something cooking. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's open it up to questions. Sure. Thank you so much for being here today, Ed. Um, my main question is, when you walk on a movie set, the romance of making a movie just goes out the window. You have controlled chaos, you have hundreds of people that you're commanding, uh, you have visions that you have that you can't accomplish, that you have to compromise and you have to improvise on the way, and you have to do this for 40, sometimes 60 days straight. Um, what is it that pulls you through that? Uh, 
Well, I mean, you take something, you have to believe so desperately and violently in this piece of material. You have to have worked it and worked it and worked it that you are so, so determined to believe that it will work because you tear it apart. It's all deconstructed and it's done in little increments. And you have to pray that when you put it back together that it will have that same effect or more than you had when you had it. But I think it's um, grit, faith, will. Um, I, I, you can't know. You're, you're right. You're underwater. You, you things are swirling around you. You don't know that you that it's working, do you? No. You know. You never. You never totally know how it's all going to come together for sure. Yeah. But you're committed. You have no choice. You know. Uh, thank you both so much for being here. Um, Legends of the Fall was one of my favorite movies growing up, so thank you for making that. Um, my question is, you mentioned liberal humanism and that there's not as much of it or enough of it in movies these days. Could you speak a little more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there are, there are things that are obvious politics and then there are personal politics. There, there are trying to explore what, what is the value of truth telling? What is psychological confrontation? What is, what is um, understanding ambivalence and the frailty of people who are ostensibly heroes but are in fact are more complex than that? I think it's about um, endowing characters with complexity and depth and ideals and um, I think it's really, obviously, case by case, but I think that, that there's a sense of, of um, uh, of, I guess, and, and instead of or, that this could, something could be, a person could be this and this, or, or, or a cause could be this and this, as opposed to the kind of straight lines and doctrine and, and um, cant of things that you tend to see um, in, in, in the world now. I agree. I was so pleased, Mr. Zwick, that you mentioned Mr. Sarah Toll and Deacons um, towards the end of the conversation. And I was struck by your having said that when you looked back at some of your films during COVID, one of the things you were struck by was this parade of relationships. And in reviewing your films over the years, I'm struck by how much beauty there is cinematographically in your films. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you've worked with the same DP. With the same? With the same cinematographer repeatedly. And so it, I kind of came to a tentative conclusion that some of that beauty is coming from you saying, okay, this is what I have in my mind and this is what I want to accomplish. And it sounded like you were saying something quite different than that tentative conclusion I'd come to in my mind. Huh. Namely, I sort of gave myself over to what John or Roger or Edwarder was telling me. And I well, was just curious, what, what, what is that? That's it, a great, it, I, I mean, I guess it's a contradiction, but I also have this thing that happens that when I work with these cinematographers they become so fucking famous and unavailable to me <laughs> that, that I have to then create another relationship. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, after John and I made, um, made Legends of the Fall, um, every director in Hollywood came into our cutting room and he won the Oscar and then he went and made Braveheart for Mel and won the Oscar again and, you know, and all of a sudden it was Francis Coppola, you know, so. And then same thing with Roger. Um, but it's, by the way, it's not just that. I mean, actually, my son Jesse, um, when I was looking for someone to work with on Pawn Sacrifice, had seen, had seen Bradford Young's movies, and I hadn't ever seen them. And I walked into a theater and literally tried to call his agent 15 minutes later. Um, and I think that, that uh, you can't, you, I guess you could, I don't know, I guess because I've never worked um, 
so consecutively. It's often been a couple years between movies for me and you can't necessarily stay in sync with the DP either because they work more regularly and they have more of that appetite to, to stay out there. So, I mean, I have done, I guess, two with John and two with Roger and two with Eduardo. So, I mean, it wasn't like we didn't have these great experiences, but it just was the, the luck of the draw. But they're so different. I mean, I mean, they're so different and I couldn't help but be influenced by each of them. Roger Deakins had been a doc cameraman in Eritrea for the, the BBC. And so for him to do Courage Under Fire brought a whole sense of presence to that movie that I might not have had if, if somebody else was unwilling to hang outside of a helicopter on a strap. That was a great story. And do the stuff that he did. Yeah. You know, John Toll had worked for Conrad Hall and Jordan Cronenworth and, 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 had, and um, somebody else wonderful. But anyway, knew more about, uh, you know, natural light and, and sort of external filmmaking, exterior filmmaking. And it was like, I had the benefit of all of his 35 years as an operator in AC that had preceded that moment. And I was just paying attention, paying attention, yeah. yeah. Hi, um, I recently went to New York and I hated it and I blame the movies and television completely. <laughs> and I'm starting my journey in the industry and I'm wondering if you were to start your journey again in 2024, what advice would you give yourself? Oh boy, yeah. that's a really hard, that's a hard one. Um, you know, the romantic fantasy, I mean, a lot of friends of mine were part of Steppenwolf in Chicago in the, in the late, in the early 80s really. And they were guys in the basement in, in someone's, you know, uh, at a school in a basement and they created this wonderful, um, a group of, of, of artists who then created their own um, ensemble, or this actually more than that, a collective really. I, I would, my fantasy would be that I could somehow bring together people and we could do things because the, because the means of production are cheaper with cameras and, and, and cutting at home and doing things. And I think this is probably misguided and just romantic, but I would like to think that somewhere great writers and actors could come together and bring down the, the towers of Babel, you know, on their own. <laughs> and and, and that, 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 that's my romantic image of what I would do. It's not entirely clear that I would do anything like that. Hey, Ed, um, I don't actually have a question. I just uh -oh. wanted to say thank you, because you, I don't know how much you remember this, but uh, you wrote an email to a first time filmmaker a long time ago um, mentioning that the documentary you'd just seen was the best documentary you'd ever seen. It was about mercenaries. It was called Shadow Company, and I was that young, first-time filmmaker, and that was it. I just want to say thank you very much. It meant a lot. Welcome. That's it. Nice. Hi, Ed and Patty. Um, I'm Lauren Chatama, and I'm also an AFI, Directing Workshop for Women. And, uh, yes, and... Um, you started, and I'm just such big fans of both of you and your work. And you, Patty, you and I met once. Yeah. And, um, but Ed, you, when you started this conversation, you said you wrote this book because you were looking to find out what that thing was. What was that thing? Love. I mean, you know, uh, this, idea that, that, um, that there was this irresistible draw, passion, allure toward um, telling stories, that the telling stories, when I was a kid, I had a very chaotic, um, there was a chaotic world around me. My parents' marriage was very uh, sort of um, screwed up in some way. And writing stories was a, was a kind of way to organize the chaos of the life around me. But I was then rewarded for it disproportionately as I grew older. And so it became not just an adaptation, but it, um, a, a calling. Um, I never have had a real job. It was just that and I, um, I believe, actually, in that 
calling. I believe that there is healing and I believe that there is a legitimate purpose to what we do for the world. And that's maybe more of this liberal humanism question. But I do believe that there's, um, there's got to be a reason that, there, that, that, that people want to see this stuff and, because I think they want from it what we can give them. That, 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 that if we hold up a mirror to the world, that people will be better for it. And then when they cry, they will cry for themselves, not just for the characters. And they will cathart, and they will be, be more open to life and, and the experience of it, and be better citizens, and all that stuff. I do, I do believe that shit. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Jason. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation so far. Um, I was doing some research and trying to watch Dirty Something because I was really young when that first came out, but unfortunately I wasn't able to stream it on Amazon. So if you could call Bezos, that would be great. Yeah, get that, or, get or that. if you could. <laughs> and then, uh, but I was able to see, refresh myself on my so-called life. And that show has been like a major antidepressant for me and I've been streaming it. <laughs> And I was just wondering exactly how involved you were with that because there's like this beautiful movement that I didn't realize when I watched it growing up of like a dance almost in that show. And it just moves so seamlessly, almost surreally from topic well, to topic. There was, I mean, look, there were some very talented people involved in that show. And um, I can, I'll name check them, but it, it, be, it, be, it began with, both Marshall and I at different times of our life wanting to write about adolescence and not having been given the license to try to be truthful about it. And then Winnie Holtzman wrote for us the last couple of years of 30 something. And when we decided to make another show, we thought that she'd be a great one to do it. And what she did is she decided to write Angela Chase's diaries as a character exercise, as a writer's exercise to try to get inside the character. And she just started writing these diaries and then showed them to us. And we looked at them, we said, Winnie, this is the show. So it was her voice and her sensibility that was the, the guiding light. Marshall and I were involved. We worked on stories with her. We directed a little bit, but it was her. But it was several other people, a, a man named Scott Winant, who had been, um, I met him first and he was a, um, I think he was the associate producer on a television movie that I did and then uh, we'd worked together at other times. He had become a director and Scott directed the pilot. And what he gave to that was a kind of very dreamy um, set of transitions and movements from one thing to the other. And then all of us kind of went, oh, we're just gonna take our cue from that and imitate that. And I think that's the thing that you're recognizing there because in some sense, the experience of being um, that 14-year-old girl was dreamy and was very internal. Uh, and, and so we tried to find a physical manifestation of that. And it was Scott who really did that. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. Uh, my name is Carlo. Uh, this could be answered by either of you. But my question is, what sort of values and actions you do on set to make actors feel more comfortable to be vulnerable, especially for newer generation of actors that are so succumbed with social media and have this quick dopamine where it's harder for them to be in the present moment, but that's such an important thing to have on set. So I am curious to know what either mm. of you think about that. Um, I mean, I, I as I tried to say before, I mean, I, I'm different now than I was when I began. I think that I do believe that there is a kind of unspoken thing that happens between a director and an actor that doesn't have to do with Stanislavski or Stella Adler, or Uta Hagen or Sandy Meisner. I think it has to do with your willingness to reveal a certain part of yourself at times. And whether or not that's confessional, it doesn't have to be. But I think when, when, you, when you walk out from behind that camera or you're talking to that actor, I think that actor has some understanding that they're taking from even the subtlest cues of how you're standing and what you're saying and how you're addressing them. They'll sense your intention and that's an exchange. 
and you have to experience it internally. You might not reveal it to them, but I know, Patty, I've seen you, and I know what you go through behind the camera, mm -hmm. right? And I think we all do, and I think it's finally a kind of um, mystical thing that happens. Um, you also have to be whatever you need to be. You can be a scourge and an authority figure. You can be a joker. You could be seductive. You can be withholding. Frankly, it, you'll be whatever you need to be in order you can get it on film and in focus once. It's funny, you're the, you're, the, I've, you're the only other director I've ever heard give that answer. I give that answer. When people say, what kind of a director are you? I said, what do you need? Like, <laughs> whatever you need, I'll be, I'll be whatever. Exactly. But I would answer that by saying, first of all, both of us are writers. Right. And I think that that's got a lot to do with it because we've played the performance in our head. Like yep. there's, no, there's no scene I haven't gone over as a writer at some point. I end up rewriting to a certain extent. And even so when I, you were the writer. Yeah, so I, so I really understand why. So first of all, I think we're going in there respecting what they have to do more than sometimes people who maybe are not. That's the best answer because I so believe that. I yeah. believe that any writer has to do exactly what right. the actor has to do, having to do even with, yeah. and, and what the director has to do with mise-en-scene, but the, the, that they have to literally go through that process yeah. so the actor can feel like it's cheating. Yeah, the, the writer in me is the director of actors. It's the me who's been like, I know, me too, I was there, and then I thought, well, what? And then I, we can also change it on the fly because I've written that scene and we can rewrite it right now a little, you know. But then the other thing is I think I, I love actors and I want them to give a great performance. So trying to get very close with them as people and make them feel safe to absolutely fail and that you're not gonna drop them. You're not gonna let them fall. So I get close enough with my actors that they feel, they know they could do a shitty take. And then we're gonna look at each other and be like, okay, not that, I'm not gonna cut that in. I'm not gonna not notice that gets cut in. They're, that's never gonna happen to them. So it's like we all have to be able to fail and try things and emotion can be vulnerable, it can be melodramatic, it can be, you gotta be able to go there and make a safe space for them to, ah, oh, okay, well let's wind that back and try something else. I think, you know, making them safe to not be great so that you can get to great. That's really it. Yeah. <laughs> and what our she said. final question for the evening. Yes, uh, which has been the harder process, making a movie or writing a book? Mm. Oh, <laughs> wow. Um, well, it, because I've never written a book before, I guess I'd have to say writing a book. Um, on the other hand, I got to do a lot of it in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of executive notes as well. No, well, that's, no that's, that's, the, that's it, right. No <laughs> test screenings. And that's the good news and the bad news. Look, yeah. a movie is 120 pages, scenes are two pages. It's like a, 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 you know, a, a villanelle or a sonnet. It has a rhyme scheme and a scansion, and you know what it's going to be, and you fit it within there. In a, mo in a book, how long is long? How high is up? What, what's the, what, what's, when dialogue? When should it be internal? How, is, is that fine? And so I was you know, underwater a lot of the time. You know, if you've ever been body surfing, you get caught in, a, in, in, in the washing machine, and you don't know where you are. That's what a book is a lot, and you have to find, I had to find a rhythm and find a whole different sense of how to do exposition. You know, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a learning experience, and I was, a, as I said before, it was good to be a little bit scared and to be a little bit out of my comfort zone. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Patty. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you.